morning. It's about time for us to get started. Can you hear me all right in the back? I don't sound very loud. Hello? I don't sound very loud. Is that better? There we go. Need all the help I can get. Thank you, Rocky. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone out today. Uh, welcome any visitors. I didn't, didn't see any, but if you are visiting with us, obviously we are truly honored by your presence this morning. I'm glad that you're here with us. and uh, Please stick around. Let us get to, to know you better. And good to see everyone out. We do have some uh, announcements outside the bulletin uh, that I want to start with. We have a, a thank you card here from Luther and Betty. So I'll read that and then um, I'll read it tonight as well. And then I'll post it on the bulletin in the back. It says, thank you for showing and sharing his love and everything you do. Betty and I want to thank each and every member of this church for their love and prayers during my hospital stay in recovery. In Christian love, Luther and Betty. There are three notebooks in the foyer with proof, proof copy of the directory. Please find the book with your page and check it. If everything is approved by you, please initial the page by the picture so we can tell it has been checked. So if we can do that, that would be appreciated. Fred Letterman Jr., uh, he's a relative of Jerry Letterman, passed away on October 9th in Oklahoma and was buried there October 13th. Uh, Fred's parents, Fred and Ida Letterman, were part of this congregation uh, many years ago. Uh, Christy's grandmother, Millie, and her stepfather, Dennis, uh, both are home and doing better. She said, uh, just you know, continue to pray for them and their recovery. Um, next week and, and really through the end of the year, uh, I could use some help with uh, treats for the jailers uh, on Sundays, so um, cookies, brownies, muffins, things like that. And obviously, like they, like me anyway, prefer the homemade stuff if you can, but if, there's, if you can find an opportunity to help and uh, serve in that capacity, uh, like I said, even starting next week, we don't have anyone signed up, so you can help with that, that would be appreciated. Uh, we did have some baptisms last week, uh, Jack Crisp, uh, Tyler Duncan, and Aaron Horton. So uh, postcards as they have been are back in the foyer. So uh, those notes of encouragement sure do uh, help those individuals. Um, looks like on uh, October 18th, uh, and then uh, some furniture needs to be unloaded, and then October 20th and 21st to load furniture. For more information, talk to Terry Cruz. So uh, if you can help uh, on those days, uh, please see Terry. Uh, the men's breakfast uh, is this week on the 18th is at 8 a.m. here at the church building. And then I won't go through each one of them, but um, in your bulletin, there's a gospel meetings coming up in, uh, in October. So the Sparta Church of Christ, uh, Bolivar Church of Christ, um, Aurora Church of Christ, so all of those are having uh, gospel meetings here in the month of October. And November 6th will be a fellowship dinner. And then December 11th, we have a congregational meeting. Uh, and then December 12th will be a youth holiday party. There will be separate parties for the younger kids and the older kids, times to be announced. So, um, and then just make note of March 5th being a special contribution opportunity for the building fund. And there's some good information and updates on that project in the bulletin as well that you might see. Obviously so many uh, we still want to pray for. Um, there's some updates in here on our sick list, but um, you know many that we want to continue in our prayers. So at, that, at this time, let's go to God in prayer. Father God in heaven, we truly do thank you for this day and we thank you for this time that we have. We thank you for allowing us to gather here without fear and persecution. Father, we thank you for the prayers that you answer on our behalf. Father, help us to never take those uh, answered prayers for granted. Father, we're thankful that Sister Judy's back with us today, and Father, we know uh, Luther's feeling better, and we're thankful for prayers on his behalf. Pray you continue to be with Judy and Luther, 
Father, also please be with Wanda and, and Pat. Father, continue to be with Patsy and Thad, John and Norma. Father, please be with um, Kay as she's uh, not feeling well as well. Um, Father, just pray with all those who are going through difficult times and, and pray for the procedures that are upcoming. Pray for doctors and nurses that will be administered to them. We pray for all those who are in need, Father, especially those spiritually who are struggling. Pray that uh, something would be said or done that they might turn their lives over to you before it's eternally too late. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, we're thankful for your church and our church home here in Marshfield. We're thankful for our elders and deacons and their wives. We're thankful for Rick and Kathy and all those who work so hard here. Father, we pray your blessings spiritually and numerically upon us. Father, we pray for safety and protection and blessings upon those who serve and protect for us, those law enforcement, firefighters, medical personnel, those military men and women that are in harm's way at this very minute. We pray that you'd be with them and their families, and we're thankful for their, their sacrifice and their help. Father, we pray for those who spread your word and, and share your word. Father, some that do so, Father, in danger, pray that you'd be with them and protect them as well. Father, pray that you be with us as we go throughout this service. Help us to, to learn. Father, help us to study in spirit and truth. We thank you for the greatest blessing of all, your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, who gave his life on Calvary so that we might have the hope of life eternal in heaven with you one day. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. I would try to quote this, but I'm not a Randy. I can't quote scripture. But um, I will. Now I can't even think where it's found. But Paul tells us that that. Uh, we ought to have the same mind as Christ had. That he, he emptied himself of being on equality with God. He came to this world to become a man. Then he emptied himself, humbled himself to die upon the cross. In a nutshell, that's what the verse says. But in that he died he came to die, specifically to die on the cross. And who did he have in mind? You and me. The songs today are going to be spread that direction. You're wondering where the guys are. Guys, I'm sorry. I switched things around. Prerogative of the song leader, right? The Lord's Supper is going to be at the end. And the reason why, Rick is, he's speaking still about the cross. And in this process, it just builds to the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to do it a little differently again today. So if you would please, first song number 129, Amazing Grace. Many of you don't need the song book on any of these songs. But here we go from here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that has saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that had taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious was that grace appeared the hour I first believed through me the dangers toil and snare. 
Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us to come together to worship you, study your word, sing praises to you. We thank you for all the many other blessings you've given to us. Thank you for Rick, the lesson he's about to bring us. We pray that we'll take it and put it to use in our daily lives. We might be better servants for you. Lord, we also thank you for our elders, for our deacons. Be with them, guide them in their decisions, their responsibilities. Lord, we thank you for also for those working in the jail ministry. Be with them, guide them, give them the knowledge, wisdom they need. Lord, we also ask your blessing on our sick. Those mentioned earlier, be with them. Pray that they could be returned to their much one health. Lord, we give thanks to you for those recovering or recovered from their illnesses. Lord, we ask you to guide us to the rest of our worship. Pray that everything we say and do be according to your will. Bring honor and glory to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark our song of invitation, it's number 315, 315, if you're using a book. I'd like to sing right now, The Old Rugged Cross. That's been the theme all week, hasn't it? All this whole series. Hey, there's not a better song to lead in what you're, what you're teaching us right there than this one right here. The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away, Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of love. At last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross So despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left this glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I 
cherish the old rugged crumb <laughs> till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown in that old rugged cross. So be blind, so divine, a wondrous beauty. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon him, sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange this someday for a crown to the old rugged cross will ever be true is shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for ever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for Good morning. So good you're here today. We're happy to have you with us, especially have to have our visitors with us and families united together, folks that were sick back with us. It's good to see Judy back there uh, in the back, have her with us today as well, and many others that have been under the weather. Do look around if you see somebody that's normally sitting where uh, they're not today. If there's an empty spot there, then give them a holler and say, hey, we missed you. Now, the um, Greer family, they're enjoying a kind of a celebration today because today is the day that, that Ben gets his white coat and Dana told me that Scott gets to present that coat. Now, that means a lot to them. So I said, take lock, lots of pictures and videos so we can see that event. That means a lot to them as Ben makes his way to the world of the veterinary medicine, following in Dad's footsteps, and that has to make him proud. This morning, I want you to think with me as we continue our study in reference to the power of the Roman cross. And as we've looked at, the power of the cross had the power to take a light. That's what it was designed and perfected for, so that a person could be nailed to that cross and they could slowly die. And that would work to deter crime throughout wherever the cross was utilized, including the entire Roman Empire. Because once someone died on that cross and folks witnessed that slow, agonizing death, that cross would be remembered. We sang the song, The Old Rugged Cross, just like we did. And that song is, is talking about the cross, but it's also talking about how we cherish or remember that cross. 
And what set it apart, of course, was that Jesus died on that cross. And oftentimes people, as we've mentioned before, will wear a cross on, on a necklace or some people even have tattoos. I'm not going to get in that line, I can assure you. Just getting a shot with one needle is bad enough. But I want you to think with me as we think about the cross and how folks do have memories and, and cherish because of what they read in the Scripture about that cross. Think about the mother who loses a son in a ter terrible car accident. And as we often see beside the road, we may not even know the individual that might have died in that location, but you'll often see a cross erected. You'll see things gathered around but, and even maybe a name on that cross. I mean, you think about that mother who lost a teenage son or daughter along that side of the road. It's almost like how could they even put a cross up? But yet that becomes a memory that is cherished. Jesus was killed on the cross. And that cross, as mentioned previously in our studies, was designed for criminals. And Jesus was judged and sentenced as a criminal to go to that cross, there to die between two criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. In Luke chapter 23, verse 22, you might remember that he said to them a third time, why, what evil has he done in reference to Pilate trying to get the Jews to understand that Jesus was an innocent man and even declares, I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And that was cruel enough. And you would think for those who were yelling for his death that that would satisfy them. At least Pilate thought that. But oh no, that's not the case. It's interesting that John the Baptist uses these words in John 1 verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, listen to the words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Isn't that interesting that John would describe Jesus as that lamb? And what kind of lamb would Jesus become? Well, he would be the lamb led to slaughter. As Isaiah 53 verse 7 tells us, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the, its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus knew what was going to have to happen in order for us to benefit from this lamb. And as Peter would write in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like with silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with, look at this, but with the precious blood of Jesus. I wish I had a lot of time to explore with you again, and we've done it in previous lessons, the word precious. But I think one of the best illustrations in reference to this precious blood of the Lamb is to think about that son or daughter who is killed beside the highway and how to a mother that's a precious son or daughter. And that never changes, does it? This precious reference to Jesus is about the blood that flowed from Calvary. It is about the blood that would flow from the beating that Jesus endured, from the crown of thorns, and also from the nails that was used to hang Jesus on that cross. That blood that flowed when it was blood and water from the side that was pierced. That's the blood that's precious. That's what makes the cross rememberable. Because the innocent Jesus went to that cross and shed his blood as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
He was the only one that could qualify to become that sacrificial lamb spoken of by Isaiah 53. And as we read in verse 39 of Luke 23, then one of the criminals who hanged uh, blasphemed, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. See, he didn't believe that Jesus was who Jesus claimed to be. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Now this is somewhat shocking in that you have the one criminal that, that is just like everybody else. They're mocking and blaspheming Jesus. But there's one man on that cross that is a criminal that said, uh-uh, there's something different about this man. And he goes on and says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But then he goes on, but this man has done nothing wrong. You know, that is quite a statement when you consider it. He understood that that was the sacrificial lamb on the cross. And those words are special in the sense that they exemplify what you and I see when we look back to the cross. This man has done nothing wrong. Jesus was innocent. I like how the writer of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are. But look at the words, yet without sin. Folks, there's not a one of us here, and I don't care how good you are that can say that. Except for the fact we can say we're justified and we're forgiven. Jesus did not need forgiveness on that cross. He actually did not need to be justified because he was already just and sinless. Thus, he was the innocent one who went there as that sacrificial lamb to die on that Roman cross that was designed to do nothing more than give someone a slow, slow death. I found in my study for this lesson an interesting website it's called Death Penalty Information Center. I don't know about you, but I didn't know something like that existed. But there is actually, it's a .org website, but it's a website that tells us about the death penalty and those numbers who go through the death penalty. And also I found on that website that talks about the innocent who have been punished with a death sentence. In fact, it said since 1973, at least 190 people have been wrongly convicted and sentenced to death in the U.S. And they know that because they have, by evidence, further evidence in court, been exonerated. Of course, there have probably been some mistakes there, but I thought that was interesting, 190 people. And they even had a map that breaks it down by state. And I found it interesting that we have had on this list in 73, four that have been exonerated as being innocent, not guilty of the crime. Interestingly enough, Arkansas's only had one. Now, I don't know if that's a lack of the evidence examination or just they do good convictions, I'm not sure. But regardless of that, it is interesting, especially when you read accounts like this was in the New York Times in, in June of 2021, it was about a Mr. Dips who was guilty for the punishment of an innocent man. What happened was he got off the crime for a while, and what was interesting, another man was wrongly convicted and incarcerated for 20 years for a crime he did not do. And the judge in sentencing Mr. Dips, Drips, I guess I should say, said this. He said, a young man spent a significant part of his life in prison for no good reason, declared the judge Joel E. Tingley, Tingy of Idaho 7th District Court. In addressing this Mr. Drips, 
He said these words, he was innocent, and that falls on you. Now, I want you to remember those words. That falls on you. Here's an interesting one I ran across. This was a Chicago man who was released from prison 20 years later after his twin brother confesses to the murder. Do you see what this man did? He let his innocent twin brother be punished Sentenced to death row for him. Interesting, isn't it? Here's a question I want to answer this morning. Who was guilty of putting Jesus on that Roman cross? We might just immediately have an answer come to mind. How many of you first thought of maybe the Roman soldiers? How many of you thought of Pilate? Some of you may even think of Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Who was guilty? Well, first of all, when you look at the trial, it is clear that Pilate was responsible for sentencing Jesus to that cross. Verse 23 and 24 of Luke chapter 23, make it clear. Verse 24, Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. He was the one in charge with saying, okay, he dies today. History records that Pontius Pilate was the fifth governor of the Roman province of Judea, serving under Emperor Tiberius from... 27, 26 in that area to 36, 37 A.D. Now what is interesting about Pontius Pilate is that in A.D. 36, the Samaritans reported Pilate to Vitellius, Roman governor of Syria, after he attacked them on Mount Gerizim. So there was a major complaint concerning the cruelty. Oh, by the way, I want to tell you, in reference to Pilate, he was credited for a Colosseum that was built in honor of Tiberius uh, in Caesarea. And this is a stone that has been found recently from the diggings there that show that he was involved in that. But Pilate really wasn't that good of a man. After the attack on the Samaritan people and their, their complaints and uprising, he was reported to Rome, and then the emperor ordered him back to Rome to stand trial for cruelty and oppression, particularly on the charge he'd executed men without proper trial. Well, I can assure you Jesus' trial was not proper, was it? He knew Jesus was innocent, but he was willing to give in to the pressure from the Jews and commit him with a sentence to death. According to CBS's Ecclesiastic History in the 4th century, he records that Pilate killed himself on orders from the Emperor Caligula. You see, the death sentence he handed to Jesus was handed to him by the Roman Emperor. But it wasn't for someone else to kill him. He was charged with killing himself, worthy of his crime. Jesus was not. But he was the one who was guilty for giving in to the Jews, for handing down that sentence. And as you look at verse 8 of Matthew 27, verse 17, after saying, look, who do you want me to give to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Well, of course, they didn't want Jesus. And so in verse 18, he knew that they handed him over because of envy. And he expected them to release him and take somebody else. Oh, no, it was Jesus. And also interesting, in verse 19 of chapter 27 of Matthew, while he was sitting at the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this man, and not just any man, that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. We're not told a lot about that, 
except for the fact it is clear this was a just man, an innocent man. And so what happened? Pilate then passes sentence, hands him off to the Roman soldiers. And they were those responsible for crucifixion. And so the scripture says in verse 27, Matthew 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus. They took him. Some of you may have watched movies like The Taken, like that where someone is taken, kidnapped, whatever. Jesus was handed over and they took possession of Jesus. And what did they do? They crucified him after a mocking and a beating and divided his garments, casting lots. They understood their responsibility. They were the ones that would put the nails into the hands and the feet. And as John 19, 24 says, therefore the soldiers did these things. Certainly they did. Yes, Pilate gave sentence, but it was those soldiers that put the nails in. And once those nails were in, it was just a matter of time before death. But folks, I want you to hear the words of Peter. When he preached the first gospel sermon recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 2. And in verse 22, Peter said this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Clearly, we have identified who he's talking to. Men of Israel. They were the ones gathered there on Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. So he clearly identifies the Jesus he's talking about. A man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs. And as you think about it, why would anybody here, you've got a man who clearly has proved himself by those miracles, wonders, and signs, why would anybody want to nail him to a cross? But folks, those nails went into Jesus, despite what he had done, despite the miracles. Even the bringing the folks back for, to life from the dead. And here's what's interesting. Men of Israel, after telling them about, reminding them of the miracles, the signs and the wonders which God wrought through men in your midst, as you yourselves know, verse 23, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken. Notice who he's talking to again, minister of Israel. You saw him. He was in your midst. But you have taken by lawless hands. And look what the charge is that he makes to the men of Israel. Have crucified and put to death. The Jews were guilty of putting Jesus to death. Oh, they might have even thought, no, 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 not us, surely not. It was Pilate who made the sentence, who handed it down, who created the plan for Jesus to be handed over to the Roman soldiers who would put in the nails. But they can't escape the accusation that Peter's making, which is true. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel not just part of the house of Israel, not just even those that were gathered there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus. And look at this, whom you crucify. That's a guilt they cannot escape. This man, under inspiration of God, made it clear to the, all the house of Israel that they were responsible for putting Jesus on that cross. But that wasn't just anyone, was it? Look at the verse. That God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, Pilate thought he was the Lord. He even told Jesus that he had the power to put him to death. Of course, Jesus put him in his place, didn't he? Told him you wouldn't have any power if it wasn't given to you from God. He thought, though, he had the power. 
That was even true when he went to kill people cruelly that were not even given proper trial. Of course, he paid for that crime. But this was not just an ordinary man, was it? But despite that, those Jews were there at that time yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Even though Pilate knew he was innocent, they were putting so much pressure even to report him back to Rome that Pilate washed his hands, but he couldn't wash his hands of the guilt. And even though they were demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, it was still a, an unjust sentence because Jesus was innocent. But verse 24 says in Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands. Folks, what good is it going to do him? He did it before the multitude. And he says to them, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Who still had blood on his hands, though? Did he really wash? No. But look at what the Jews say. Verse 25. All the people, all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Little did they know it was. And that is exactly what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. But folks, this goes a little bit further. You see the first word in red? It wasn't just Pilate. It wasn't just the soldiers. It wasn't just the Jews, all Israel. It's all, period. All are guilty of the cruel cross for Jesus. As Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to those Romans, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And folks, that's the line. Once we reach the age of accountability that we're standing in, we're ungodly. We're sinners. All have sinned. Romans 6, verse 23. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. How did God do that? God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who did Christ die for? He died for those who are guilty. It's hard to think about it, but Jesus died for Pilate. Jesus died for the Roman soldiers that drove the nails in. Jesus died for the Jews. Jesus died for all of us. Because all are guilty of sin. I love the words in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. We all know John 3, 16. But look at the words of 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love. What's John 3, 16 says? For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son. And then John later writes in verse 16 of chapter 3. Of course, that man put that there, but they did a good job getting that one. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. I hope that verse is imprinted on your heart. I hope that when later you partake of this communion that those words will sit in your mind. He laid down his life for us. That day when the pain was covering over his body at almost every point. That day when he was bleeding and fighting for every breath, facing that slow death on the cross, he did so for you. Why? Because we're all guilty. In chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 John, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, and that's even after becoming a Christian, we will. But there's a solution. Remember, we're talking about righteousness. 
and being made just in the eyes of God? How does that happen? What did Jesus do? I write to you so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Oh, not us. We would never qualify to be the sacrificial lamb. We could hang on a million crosses, and it would not make any difference because it took the lamb, Jesus, the righteous, to hang on the cross. And thus, in verse 2, he became the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours, but also the whole world. Someone says, well, what is that big old word that you just spit all over the microphone about? Propitiation. Well, it is the atoning sacrifice. And that atoning sacrifice refers to that price of redemption that was paid by Jesus on the cross. And look at what he says. And not for our sins, but also the whole world. Where would the whole world be if Jesus had not been that sacrificial lamb? Well, they would be guilty without any hope. I want you to go back, think with me just a moment about that cross sitting beside the highway. It represented a lot of grief for loved ones. And when a mama would drive by and see maybe a child there, it would be some heartache. Because she would see that as the end. With no hope to have that child back alive. Folks, guilt creates grief. We're guilty. We were responsible as well, not just Pilate, not just the Roman soldiers, or even the Jews. It was us. But because of that, there was a result that occurred in Acts 2, verse 37, that we must never forget. And I hope it is a result that you have experienced. And if not, I hope this morning when we stand and sing an invitation song, that it will be something that will motivate you and your life. Because verse 37 says, when they heard this, what did they hear? That they were guilty of putting Jesus on the cross, an innocent man, the sacrificial lamb. When they heard it, and Peter made it clear they couldn't miss it, when they heard it, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Folks, it's real easy to read the book of Acts and just lightly go through it, isn't it? Yeah, this happened. Peter preached and gave the plan of salvation and folks obeyed it. And then they, they were the church. Wonderful, right? But folks, where would Acts 2 be without this verse? It tells us what changed their life, what made the difference. They were cut to the heart. And folks, when that occurs in our lives, it is that which motivates us to change. And as we come together and partake of this Lord's Supper, each week it is there to remind us so that that which originally caused us to make a change in our life because of what Jesus did for us is a memory and when you think about cherishing the old rugged cross that's what we cherish the fact that he was the lamb the innocent one who went there for me and you and the whole world and folks we need to let that cut us to the heart when we get up in the morning we need to think about the day that the Lord has given us and the opportunity we have and the very reality of the fact that I'm able to be a Christian because of the fact that Jesus died on the cross that cut me to the heart. And it should every day of our lives. It's what makes the difference. So that we're going to say, God, here am I, send me. God, here am I to do your will. God, here am I because of what you've told me to do. And what was the answer Peter gave those Jews who were asking? 
We all know, don't we? Probably most of us could quote it. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is Peter wanting from them? He's wanting them to do exactly what Saul did before he was renamed Paul. He wanted them to rise and be baptized and wash away their sins, calling. That's the process of faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. It is the response to the answer given. What shall we do? Why is it a response? Because it's the answer for the guilty. And this morning, if you're here and you recognize you are in sin, but yet you understand what Jesus did for you so much that you're saying, well, what do I need to do? Well, here's the plan. If, if you're here and you've not yet been baptized and made that decision, I'm going to give my life to Christ. I'm truly going to change. And I'm willing to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized for remission of sins. If you're here and you haven't done that, what's your heart like? Is it saying to Jesus, I don't care. I don't care. You died on the cross. That happened over 2,000 years ago. How can you not care about that sacrificial lamb who went as an innocent man for your guilt? This morning, if you can understand what this lesson is about and the message, and you know your life's not in harmony with God's will, and it could be even as a Christian, you, you've let... Other things take from you and what should be in your heart about what Jesus wants from you. The sacrifice of yourself. We're going to stand. We're going to sing an invitation song if we can assist you. Why not make it known as we stand and sing, would you come to the front?
Please be seated. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to sing number 176, The Lamb of God. I want you to pay particular as you sing in this, folks. This is one of those songs that will prick you to the heart. Because the first two verses talks about Jesus being the Lamb of God. But the third one, when you and I actually understand what's going on, is going to make us a lamb of God. What I want to do, I want to sing all three verses and then the refrain at the end, okay? Your only son no sin to hide but you have sinned him from your side to walk upon Crucified, they laughed and scorned him at his name. The humble king they named the prod and crucified the lamb of God. I was so I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be with my your staff and rod, and to be called a lamb of God. Oh, lamb of God, sweet lamb of God. I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, watch me in His precious blood. My Jesus prepared uh, devotional this morning and I, I was not sure that I should move on with it because of the lesson that we just heard but I think I'm going to go ahead and the reason I'm going ahead is that without what I'm about to say about to read all this is vain in Luke chapter 23, verse 52, it's speaking here of uh, Joseph. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. That's after the sacrifice. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the day of preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how, he, how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared the spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, 
they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their heads, faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful man and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Without Christ rising, none of this would make any difference. Our worship would be in vain. The things that we do this day would be in vain. But Christ rose. He was the first of us to rise. And he is in heaven at the right hand of God this very minute. Before us, you see the bread and you see the fruit of the vine. The bread represents that body that was crucified on the cross so elegantly mentioned this morning. And the fruit of the vine represents that blood that was shed that we were baptized into. As we enter into this Lord's Supper, Bob will lead us in prayer for the bread. Father, indeed, we are reminded this day, Father, of the, the sacrifice that not only was necessary, but, Father, that happened, that demonstrated the love that you have had and yet have for us. We're thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus gave. Realize, Father, that through that sacrifice, through the blood that was shed, we have hope. And, Father, we're thankful for the resurrection, for therein is the guarantee, Father, of our hope. And we would ask you, Father, this morning that as we take this bread that represents the body. Father, that we might do so in a manner to be pleasing in your sight. And Father, we do, do pray that you'll help us to examine ourselves to be sure, Father, that we're worthy to take all this sacrifice. Father, we humbly ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
our Father in heaven, we thank thee, Father, for another beautiful Lord's Day, Father, you bless us with, Father, thankful for another day on this earth, Father, thank thee for this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood who died on that cross for us so we can have the hope of eternal life, Father, we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, Father, that it is done in a manner that is well-pleasing unto thee, it's in Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Was anybody overlooked? This time is also set aside to collect up an offering uh, to give back a portion that we've earned. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. Father, we just ask you, and we thank you for our jobs that we have, for our income. Father, we just ask you to be with us as we prepare our hearts to give back, and that it will be used to glorify your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
At the conclusion of this song, this will be our final song, but at the conclusion of this song, we'd like for wait just a couple of seconds. We have a special presentation we want to make. And Paul will be reading that to us in just a few seconds. Okay? If you would please, number 346. Number 346, he lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, salvation is today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him. Today is a wonderful day to be able to come and worship the Lord, but it's also kind of bittersweet. We're saying goodbye to three wonderful people that we have come to love and look at as family. They are returning back to closer to their hometown, and I'm sure that the grandparents are just static about that. And the almonds, this is their last Sunday with us, and we want to give them a small token of our love. We have here a, a Bible that we want them to have to remember us by. If you haven't signed the card for the almonds, it's in the foyer. Be sure and do so. At this time, we'd like to have a special prayer for them. If you'll bow with me. Our dear, gracious, holy, heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Father, for the many, many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, but especially today, Father, we're thankful that we have this opportunity to come together to worship you, Father. And indeed, that makes it a special day. And Father, as we have worshiped you today, we pray that our worship was acceptable in your sight. And we ask now that you would go with our brother and sister as they return back to their hometown. Bless them, Father. May they ever walk in your path as they will always walk in our hearts. And Father, we pray for them that you will use them there and we know that they will be useful in your service no matter where they are in this world. And Father, we love them very much and we will miss them we want them to know that our hearts and our homes are open to them at every opportunity to come back and visit with us. Father, you give us wonderful blessings. And you give us the reason for our hope that if for some reason we would never see them again, we will see them in heaven, if it be thy will. And Father, it's through your Son, our Lord and Savior, we pray these things. Amen. Now, 
But I can remember things. There's several in our congregation that are sick and not doing well. Several that are improving. I'm seeing Judy sitting back there. Oh, it's encouraging seeing that. But we need to remember a bunch of others. There's several that are spiritually sick as well. We pray that you would be with them. As we have one more final prayer, with these, let's remember those who is in our hearts. Thank you, Father, for blessing us and encouraging us. Thank you for bringing us here today. May our worship be pleasing to you. Be with us as we return tonight to once again offer our songs of prayer and appreciation to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.